Princess Celestia the Changeling Queen. Chapter 12. The Drawing of the Lines. War must be, while we defend our lives against the destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. J.R.R. Tolkien, The Two Towers. I usually like my chairs to be soft and comfortable, preferably covered in worn velvet or perhaps by cool faux leather. Yet for the moment, I was content with the unyielding support of a high-backed cedar throne. I could not afford to be relaxed. I hadn't called a meeting of the equestrian chiefs of staff for a year. Thus, it had been a while since I had sat in the equestrian war room, a low-ceilinged oval chamber dominated by a huge table of polished oak. Yet the centerpiece of this room was the topographical representation of Equestria and her surrounding neighbors. This model was highly detailed with miniature cities, various landmarks, hills, tiny trees, and mountains. Even a miniature railway line had been built with a diminutive Friendship Express. Scattering throughout the map were miniature ponies holding the standards of various equestrian regiments. I resisted the urge to sigh. Already the chatter of officers, majors, and generals had filled the war room as they filed into the chamber and took their seats. Back when I was a changeling queen in training, I hadn't needed to go through so much protocol and planning. Then again, I had only been leading around 300 loyal changelings. Now? I had the lives of an entire nation at my hooves. I saw that Luna was focused on the center of the table, studying some of the troop placements. At the same time, she had several files detailing some of the most updated weapons available to Equestria's military. These pole arms were enchanted to deliver bolts of lightning upon impact and would be very useful for our Pegasi cavalry. I then turned to Twilight. My student was nervously stacking and restacking her papers. Admittedly, I did pull my student away from the wedding preparations to take the meeting's minutes, but I did think that attending this meeting would be a good experience. With a final glance to the clock, I decided it was time to begin. <clears throat> the buzz of officers and commanders ceased. Raising my voice, I addressed the entire chamber of ponies. Shouting armor, captain of the second equestrian royal guard. Just to my right, my loyal captain snapped a textbook salute. He had abandoned his red wedding parade jacket for his royal guard captain armor. The smile was gone, I stalwartly facing forward. General Caesar Salad, of the first dragoon guards and of Central Army Group. My eye searched the room to see Caesar, dressed in his trademark toga, raising his vine stick in acknowledgments. The unicorn was a cranky character, but I knew he was loyal to my cause. Major General Iron Duke, of the 80th Manhattan Rangers, and of the Northeastern Army Group. An earth pony clad in immaculate red and gold uniform raised his hoof, his face an emotionless stone mask. Most ponies would have been put off by Iron Duke's cold demeanor, but I knew he was a softie. When Twilight was younger, he would always sneak her some candy corn when he thought I wasn't looking. Lieutenant Sharp, 88th Manhattan Rangers. A tan earth pony on Duke's right with a deep scar on his right cheek saluted quickly, albeit with a wrong hoof. I had heard a few things about Sharp from a Port Senpai superior Iron Duke, who wrote about him that Sharp had absolutely no respect for authority, which is his greatest weakness, and admittedly, his greatest strength. Meringue Le Fay, head sorceress of the Royal Equestrian Casters. Instantly, I found the cream-colored hoof of the only pony not wearing a military uniform, and her smile. Meringue was a mystery, even to me. Exceptionally skilled in baking magic, the unicorn could make the best lemon meringue pie in Equestria. Yet she devoted herself to pursue combat magic to spell doom for Equestria's enemies. All she would ever wear was a simple velvet green cloak and a sorceress's pointy hat of the same color. However, even now I could see officers and some of the generals glancing appreciatively at her rich chocolate mane and sparkling green eyes. General Hannibal, of the Southeastern Army Group and of the 23rd Legion Entregar de Equestria. After searching the table, I picked out my old friend's dark brown coat and blinked. The Earth Pony was wearing a distinctive gold leaf helmet and polished curious of the interlinked bronze discs. It was the armor I had awarded to wear for leading a deadly successful campaign against the marauding southern dragons. I grinned happily, pleased at her gesture, and she responded with a predatory smile I had taught her. Lieutenant General Bloody Guts, Western Army Group, 12th Van Hoover Artillery Regiment. A rather plain-faced unicorn in a brown army jacket and a faux fur overcoat raised his hoof. I had always wondered how Guts got in his name. The stallion was always so normal, almost ordinary. But ever since I had assigned him as commands, the Western Army Group had not had a single fatality. Colonel Stonewall, 5th Las Pegasus Royal Hussars. A solidly built earth pony with rather impressive sideburns, as well as a beard, stood and saluted. He wore a grey-blue uniform with a cap, and a long saber at his side. From what I've heard, he was a capable officer, skilled in leading attacks and holding strategic positions. Marshal Armin Rommel, Royal Equestrian Air Command and CEO of the Cloudsdale Blues. 
A middle-aged Pegasus in a neatly ironed dark gray uniform gave me a solemn salute. Her mane was a former Wonderbolt, and it showed in his muscled frame which sported remarkably large wings. From his lapel hung the golden cross of Equestria, matching his golden yellow fur. I'd given him the award after he led a squadron of victory over an entire air wing of Griffin Bandits and sent them back to Griffonia with their tails between their legs. Finally, I read the last name on the list. Captain Vlad Pikehead of the Lunar Guard. Looking up, I observed the Thestral salute. His family, in fact his entire tribe, were longtime members in the Lunar Guard. I'd maintained the guard during my rule and protected the Thestrals. Despite the headache I suffered from that decision, I believe the gamble had paid off. The continued existence of the Lunar Guard really helped Luna's reintegration with Equestrian society, and they were highly useful to the Equestrian army as an elite stealth force. With the attendance completed, I raised myself from my chair, addressing all my commanders. Thank you all for coming here with such short notice. As you are aware, Canterlot was attacked by a changeling force. Their leader, Queen Chrysalis, imprisoned my niece Princess Cadence and took her form. She then proceeded to hypnotize Captain Shining Armor. By siphoning off his love energy, Chrysalis weakened the security shield that we had erected, allowing her forces to break into Canterlot. I paused and grimaced. Chrysalis also imprisoned my own student, Twilight Sparkle, and the crystal mines that lie underneath Canterlot because she was perceptive enough to see through her disguise. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Twilight trying to hide her blush behind her papers. But Chrysalis made a critical mistake. She imprisoned Twilight with my niece. Together, they were able to break out of the mines and reveal her true identity. A little of my anger must have leaked through my mask, because some of the officers shivered at my tone. However, it was too late. The Queen had siphoned too much of Captain Armor's magic, the shield being compromised, and it fell after the Changeling army assaulted it. After she was unmasked, I confronted Chrysalis, but she had siphoned up too much of Captain Armor's love and I was subsequently defeated. Princess Luna, who had been preparing for the wedding reception, was ambushed by a Changeling Battalion. Special mention goes to Captain Vlad and his Lunar Guard for protecting my sister while she dealt with the threat. Vlad grinned as the other generals nodded their approval. I sent for my students and her friends to get the elements of harmony, but they were intercepted. The only reason why I'm talking to you today is that Cadence and Captain Armor combined their magical reserves and channeled it into a shield spell, repelling the changelings from Candlelot. However, we cannot confirm Chrysalis' death, and neither can we confirm if she can mount a counteroffensive. Luna took over, the Iron Authority in her voice resounding throughout the room. The goal for this gathering is to determine Equestria's course of action, primarily how we should protect our cities, and how we should respond to the Changeling threat. We would now like to hear thy suggestions. There was a momentary pause as the various commanders processed the information. To my surprise, Caesar was the first to raise his hoof. I suggest that we should first increase the Candlelock garrison and have the second Royal Guard undergo an independent review of all of its procedures. Then, we should have the rest of the other cities' garrisons checked for infiltrators. I raised an eyebrow. I agreed that a review should be conducted in light of the ineffectiveness of the Royal Guard, but I didn't quite understand why Caesar was insisting that it should be independent. And neither did Shining Armor, as he spoke up right after Caesar. Begging your pardon, General Salad, but I think the Royal Guard can conduct its own investigation into the matter. Caesar shook his head. <sighs> Captain Armor, let me be blunt. Your regiment's performance at the Royal Wedding was disastrous. I blinked, and my captain's eyes narrowed. I knew there would be some resentment regarding the invasion of Canterlot, but I never realized the discussion was going to take such an ugly turn. I can understand why your shield failed, you were hypnotized and all, but just because you were taken in by a changeling disguised as your own wife does not mean that the entire Royal Guard has the right to collapse in on itself and cease to be an effective fighting force. According to reports, almost all Royal Guards were incapacitated or isolated within 15 minutes. Your Highness, you were captured by Chrysalis herself, and somehow, no pony was able to assist you. I demand to know, Captain Armor, how could you let this military disaster happen? Roared Caesar. His vine stick pointed like a spear at shining armor. I said nothing, knowing that I had to let my captain defend his own actions against a superior. I'd been alerted to a possible threat by Princess Celestia, although at the time, we knew not what the threat was, neither the size of it. Given the lack of information, I decided to deploy the Royal Guard to maximize security against small group or individual attacks. Hence, I spread the Royal Guard out in small five-pony squads, with several key rally points established within the city, including the Guard Barracks, the Train Station, and Canterla Castle itself. Moreover, I also put up my shield spell. However, this formation was wholly inadequate against the large-scale air-to-ground assault that took place. The patrol sizes were too small, and the changelings were able to isolate and overwhelm them. But if we had been aware of the scale of the changeling attack, I would have deployed my troops in a different fashion. 
Caesar was still frowning, but he had put his vine stick back down. The other officers were murmuring their grudging approval. What I do wish to know is how could such a large air force sneak into attacking range of Canterlot without any warning whatsoever? Asked Shining Armor. I nodded at my captain's question, for it perplexed me as well. Just, how was my sister able to sneak an entire changeling army into the middle of Equestria if her hive was in the Badlands? Marshal Armain, do you have an explanation for this? You're in charge of monitoring the airspace near Canterlot and Cloudsdale, after all, said Caesar snidely. Rommel then glared at Caesar. We appear to have been infiltrated by the changelings that changed the schedules of the patrols. This created an hour-long gap times exactly for the last vows of the wedding. Admittedly, there could have been more patrols, but we had just completed joint exercises with the Las Pegasus Sars, and I was loath to tax my exhausted troops any further. Besides, who would have expected an entire changeling army to slip past the Southern Army Command? I held back a groan, silently wishing our main could have been less blunt. Now all of the officers of the Southern Army Command were furious. Annabelle herself had risen to her hooves, dark eyes flashing menacingly. Damn, some of them are very eager to put the blame on the other commanders. I feel bad for those poor bastards. Anyways, let's get on to our leaders of donators. Top donators TacoCat598, Peter Coleshard, J Tin Man, Darkseid, Ponyman, and Gauntlet. Zar630, Strix, Raiden, Narwhals, Black Moonheart, Drake Love Dragon, Pastel Skies, Dospo, Madman Stan, Delta Omega, Jack Hedge, Runeslife9852, Hunt and Norman, Dash of Evergreen, Rhiny Dragonwolf, Tal Rasha, The Toilet Snake, Sword Brother and Mordred, Ron and Wandering, Random Person Man Guy, Easy, Sky Ochia, Leslie Prickett, Jordan Peterson, Crimson Kids and A9, Light Skin, Monster Kitty, Tim Bob, Starlight Glimmer, Lightning Blitz, Squiddy Boy, David E. Sanchez, Soul Dragon, Gaggy, Trey, Shadow Drake, Joe Piercy, Hunter Mara, Alex F, Rainbow Dash, Teal K. Anderson, TV Killer, John Becker, Leon Reynolds, Raven Speedster, Zach Rakow, Mystery CU, Edgar Garcia, One Kingdom One, Nissa Rusan, Vizuri, Dyslexic Character Sheets, Just a Random Boy, Hadrick Clincart, A Crazy Person, Ponyman365, Neapolitan, Six of Nine, Shyfire, Stamp, and Diane Baseri. Thank you all very much for watching this video, and live life to the fullest.